I'm Josh Cooperman, and this is Convo by Design with another installment of the Wellness and Design Thought Leadership Series presented by Thermosol, featuring a powerful, self-described late bloomer in her design career and is making up for lost time. Sound familiar? This is Texas-based designer Michelle Lynn. <laughs> I kind of feel like we're all late bloomers at this point. I'm continually adjusting the Convo by Design brand and reforming the way I do business because the world is changing very quickly and life moves pretty fast. If you don't stop and look around once in a while, you could miss it. Yes. For those playing the home game, that was a Ferris Bueller quote. Not sorry. It's true. Michelle Lynn is a perfect example, and if you ever find yourself wondering what your next move is, listen to this from Michelle. She gets it. She did it. Life isn't a point-to-point excursion. It's a journey of creative self-discovery. In addition to the design biz, she also enjoys training other designers about running their own businesses. The MLG experience is something she is passionate about and will share the ideas behind it with you as well. We're also going to talk about her work in Dallas and beyond. Enjoy this conversation with Michelle Lynn of ML Interiors Group, the latest installment of the Wellness and Design Thought Leadership Series presented by Thermosol. You'll hear from Michelle in just a moment, but first, this. For well over a year now, you have been hearing incredible conversations, interviews, and panels with amazing creative talent as part of our Wellness and Design Thought Leadership Series presented by Thermosol. It has been and continues to be an absolute joy working with the entire team at Thermosol from the top down. This multi-generational family business has been producing the gold standard in steam generators, saunas, steam showers, and steam shower accessories for decades. Thermosol is the original steam shower with technology that is state-of-the-art, made and manufactured in the United States. The company's history with steam shower started by David Altman in 1958. Murray Altman acquired Thermosol's steam bath division in 1989, and the company is now led by Mitch Altman from their world-class production facility in Round Rock, Texas. The most successful designers and architects are using steam showers to maximize wellness, relaxation, and enjoyment for their clients. Thermosol is a staunch advocate for the design trade, and I am so proud to have them as a presenting partner of Convo by Design and the Wellness and Design Thought Leadership Series. If not familiar with the entire range of Thermosol products, please check out thermosol.com. <laughs> I, can, I can finally take that deep breath. You know what's really funny what's is, ha- have you noticed that the fits and starts due to the pandemic and coronavirus, like we're super busy and then nothing happens because nobody can work and it doesn't matter anyway because nothing that we get is being delivered anyhow? Oh my gosh. It is just a, it's an exercise in patience. Yes, exactly. Both for clients, the designers, vendors. It's just such a new reality that we're living in. It's crazy. Yeah. And I'm curious, how do you, how are you managing your schedule? How are you managing your clients? How are you managing the, and it's so funny too, because while I know that I am not the only one who is tired of the two words, uh, supply and chain in that order, um, Mm -hmm. it is what it is and you have to deal with it. Yeah, we, um, we just have to be proactive. So I'm fortunate. I have an amazing team and we just continually talk about ways to assist our clients in the discomfort that we're all experiencing. And I think a lot of it's also, it depends on the type of project that we're working. So if it's a construction, if it's a renovation project or, or new build or something, and then you're wanting to do the furnishings as well, it's a juggling act, but we just have to promote that and share that with our clients and do our due diligence when it comes to vendors that we're selecting. So it's been a lot of research. And by the way, I'm, I'm curious about that. You know, for years, when I would talk to designers in particular, architects as well, but designers really in particular, mm-hmm. and designers were starting to tell me, it's like, you know, I don't have 
the time mm -hmm. to focus on certain things. This is before, this is pre pandemic. Right. I don't have the, I don't have the time to focus on certain things that I used to focus on before. Like I'm, I'm using 120% of my given time to do my job, which means that I'm taking time from the kids, yoga, walking the dog, relaxing, watching TV, just recharging, taking that time. How have you learned to manage and how has it changed in the last two years? Well, I think both for my, for, for my design firm, as well as for um, my, my clients, my, uh, my student clients, not my design clients. One of the things that we really have implemented as well as educated is that outsourcing is key right now. We, we've switched to outsourcing our procurement and that has been a game changer because procurement now is almost a full-time job because the, the individual who does it for us and whether it is outsourced to an outside agency or you hire somebody to be your expediter, procurement manager and so forth, as the, as the designer, you don't need to be doing that. So that's been one thing that has given us some breathing room and is something I definitely promote because design is design, but chasing all of these loose ends is exhausting. How has that changed? You're absolutely right. I totally agree. How has that changed the internal structure of your company? It has given us a lot more free time to be creative. And what I teach as well is that you don't get paid. You, your sweet spot is designing. So spending time in that creative mode as much as possible, as well as client services, like you have to service your client, is so much easier when you are not bogged down figuring out where things are, when they're going to be in. Did the order even get, um, was the order even received? We still have vendors on fax machines. Like, really? <laughs> Did you get the fax that we tried to send? <laughs> So uh, as, a, as we've outsourced the procurement, it has given us a lot of that breathing room that we needed and pre-pandemic pre and then post-pandemic, it just kind of confirmed that we don't need to be doing that. That is just one thing. One, that's one example of what we've outsourced. I've outsourced social media. I've outsourced obviously bookkeeping and, and stuff like that, but you have to hand it over to the expert in order to be your own expert. You, you can't be a good designer if you're exhausted. I mean, you can, but it's just no fun. So let's, let's drill down on that a little bit because you know what? It, I'm, I'm so pleasantly surprised that you said that because that's something that I've, we sort of dance around it, right? Everyone thinks, well, you have, you have a, you have a skill set. you have your own talent, you know what you do. Just go, just go do it. Just go do the work. Nobody wants to hear any complaints. Clients don't want to hear, you know, you're tired. They don't want to hear you're overworked because everyone's tired and everyone's overworked and everyone's yes. trying to figure out new things. But there is something, and we don't talk about this nearly enough, the mental side of creatives. When, yeah. when, when, you're, when you're mentally beaten down or physically exhausted, mm -hmm. it is so much more challenging and so much more difficult to be creative. The yeah. process of being creative is, is one that requires fully charged batteries, right? So how do you, how do you stay, how do you stay present? How do you stay focused? So actually it's a great question. Um, I have to literally create white space in my life. So whether it is me putting something on my calendar, like do not book, or, or, you know, booking a massage, or I literally have on my calendar. So my team doesn't book me. I don't book myself because I'm usually the one that books myself um, blocks of time. So it's just like, I need to rest and recharge my word for this year. I, I, I pick a word for every year instead of making resolutions and it's be still like, I know that's two words, but it's be still <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I overachiever. Um, so in that respect, it's just a reminder because I love to work. So I love to work. And in all honesty, Josh, my team does more of the creativity design work. Um, my designers do while I build the business as well as the educational division of my firm. But it's still the same thing because I'm as building a business. You just have to step back. And I think that the subconscious or the unconscious 
really spends time working on any sort of problem that you have or any sort of um, puzzle might not be a problem, but it's a puzzle, whether you're trying to uh, create a, a design solution for a client, or if you're trying to create a new product to, uh, to share with, with your audience, just being still in the back of your mind, it's still always working. Think about that. If you, I, I really try to not Google things that I'm trying to remember, okay, who was that actor's name? Like, just let it be in the back of your head and it will come to you. And I, I believe that that's the same thing when it comes to any sort of design dilemma or business puzzle or anything like that. You're so right. And, and it's interesting you talk about be still is, is, your, mm-hmm. is, is your kind of like your mantra for the year and phrase. I, I think it's really interesting because I do, I do something similar. I don't do it by calendar year. I do it when I feel it needs to change. Yes. Um, and it's funny because if anybody who's listening wants to go back and hear you, go listen to two years ago. And I forget what it was two years ago. And I, I don't know what it was three years ago, but it, it's always in the sign off on mm-hmm. the podcast. It's always what I end with. And um, I want to say I changed mine in maybe April or May of last year. And it was it was today first. Nice. And I needed that at the time. Because while we were locked down, I found myself having, you know, nine, 10 hour long Zoom meetings every single day. Ooh. And it, it was just between my consulting and doing interviews and mm-hmm. working with clients. And it got to be so overwhelming that I started, I started getting like, I, it wasn't a mental breakdown, by, <laughs> but it was, it was like this instead of it being a, a breakdown, I think the best way that I could, I could define it is it was just an over cluttering of the mind. And yeah. I, I found myself completely incapable of being creative. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I found myself having some interviews where I was asking like the same questions and I felt myself getting mund- mundane and, and predictable. And yeah. for, for me, I hate that. I'm curious tell me about the business side versus the education side and how the two commingle. So I think what I, what I discovered when I just a little bit of backtrack, when I started my business, my interior design business, ML interiors group, there was, this was what, 15 years ago, 12 years ago, 14, 15 years ago, there wasn't a lot of people talking about how to, and there's no standard way to operate an interior design business. So I like trial by error, you know, by the skin of my teeth and just like, I'm not going to give up. I'm going to get this figured out. And so the business side, I thought I was a badass business person because I had previously managed two completely separate multi-million dollar business units in, in different industries. So I thought I could come in and just, you know, work 25 hours, <laughs> create beautiful places and, and, and make a bucket of money. And it, that just didn't work. So I promised myself once I figured it out that I would share it with others. And so lots of trial and error, lots of money lost, lots of gray hair, lots of tears. Um, fast forward to 2018, my daughter, um, my now daughter was born. We adopted her and I left for a month. And I wasn't across the seas or anything. I was up in Michigan, but my team never called me. So I called them. I was like, y'all, is everything okay? And they're like, yeah, we're just following the processes that we have written down. I'm like, okay, cool. So obviously we've got this stuff figured out. Um, and at that point, you know, my another child was born and that was the educational platform of, of um, design for the creative mind, which was born out of ML interiors group and the processes that we put together. So the business aspect is not natural for most creatives. So being able to take that and have my left and my right side of my brain, you know, argue and still share, share the insight has just been such a huge blessing to, to me. I know I'm where I'm supposed to be. And then just being able to impact designers businesses has been such a great crossover. And my team um, runs the design side um, operationally, and I still oversee it, but they also help me in the uh, educational side of the business. It's been amazing. 
What's the structure for the educational side of the business? So our flagship program is a, is a one-year program and we have it, a lot of it is recorded online and we have downloads and we have worksheets and we have a Facebook community and we have um, weekly meetings. I have master coaches who come in um, once a month and then once a quarter. And we have, we have the Zoom calls where I'm present for a couple of hours every month as well. And gosh, there's just so, it, it's just, it's taken off like crazy. And it's just been such a blessing. And that's called the Interior Design business bakery <laughs> and it's the bakery because it's, it's a recipe. It's a recipe for your business. And so we have multiple modules, everything from, um, you know, identifying your own um, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats, your own niche, and then identifying your ideal client profile and how do you market to them? And then what services do you offer and the pricing, like how do you price your, your design fees? And then it goes down to their calling. Now what? because every project is different, but the process should be the same. So we really just solidify all of that. And that's seriously, when I was struggling with my own business, I had an epiphany. It's like, duh, you ran these other multi-million dollar businesses. It was with processes and procedures. Do the same thing for your own darn business. <laughs> it was, like, it was just, you know, so simple, so simple. I, I find it interesting too, you know, if you are a student of the game, mm -hmm. you see patterns develop in front of you. Yes. It's really interesting because having, having interviewed as many designers as I have, there is this, you know, you can, you can look at it like rings on a tree or spikes in a, in a graph. There, there is an influx into creative endeavors every time there's a major world shift. And, you know, if you go back to 1987, there was a spike in design, architecture, arts, creativity. If you go back to 08, 09, during the financial crisis, yeah. there was a spike. If you go back to- <laughs> That was me. That was you. <laughs> if you yes. go, yeah. If you, go, if you go back a little, you know, between the two and you look at 9-11, there, there was a spike. Mm -hmm. And we are now in the midst of another spike due to the past, you know, two years, by the way, is it not crazy that, you know, March, March 13th is, is going to be, what is it? It's going to be technically two years. Yeah. Right. That we've been in, that we've been in the midst of this thing officially. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, if you look back at the start, we're, we're approaching three years yeah. really as, and, as to when this thing started. And, and, and it's really, it's panned out well for designers because everybody's been locked in their house yeah. and they're looking around deciding, am I going to move or am I going to make some renovations? Yeah. But at the same time, it's harder to get product than ever before. It's an yeah. interesting. So it, it, it presents this opportunity at the same time you talk about SWAT, right? But you, you look mm -hmm. at threats, mm -hmm. a threat is, and, and I, I'm glad we're, we're having this conversation because I think it's really important. A, a threat to design is every time there's an, a major influx into any creative endeavor, be it real estate or design or anything else, you have people who are not necessarily committed to it. They just jump in because they feel like, well, I can't do anything else right now. And that's the hot category. So I'm yeah. just going to go do that. They come in, they, they stir things up. Anyone who wants, who works hard enough can find clients, mm -hmm. you know, they don't know how to price. They don't know how to specify. They don't know how to design necessarily. And, and so no guidelines and there's no guidelines. So when you look at that threat in particular, um, what's your approach? What's your, what's your guidance? What's your advice for those who are just now entering the field? It's a business, not a hobby because so many people who are just naturally talented are just naturally talented and they're inclined to go in that direction. It's it, it, but you have to treat it like a business. And it's for a couple of reasons. One is if you're going to be, if you're willing to give your time and take it away from your family, your friends, your health or whatever, it, it needs to be of value to you personally. But also the, the clients that are a joy to work with will pay for your professionalism because they are professionals. So the best clients are going to want to pay you for a business, not just a hobby solution. 
And so showing up as a professional and as the leader of this project is, is key to sustainability, profitability, as well as cost your sanity. Because otherwise clients will just start spinning you around like a, like a, a top. And that's not fun. It's not fun. You are listening to my conversation with Michelle Lynn, and we'll be right back to that in just a moment. I know you love talking about great partnerships the same way I do. Let me tell you about an incredible design partner who is working with us on the Convo by Design Remote Design House Tulsa project, Franz Wigner, a company created in 1899 in Attendorn, Germany. They started manufacturing brass beer taps. In 1921, the company expanded to Buenos Aires, manufacturing brass faucetry. The company launched in the U.S. in 1992, and Franz Wigner Premium Collection began in 2008. Franz Wigner crafts high-quality, premium faucets with the objective to create a design-oriented luxury product that exceeds the standards set by world-class designers and architects. Pretty heady stuff, and they do it. If you see a Franz Wigner faucet, it is stunning. You use Franz Wigner faucets, and they perform flawlessly. Product you can depend on after over 120 years designing a truly stunning faucet line. For more information and to check out the entire line of faucets, visit franzwigner.com. So I'm going to spell it for you, right? (laughs) F-R-A-N-Z-V-I-E-G-E-N-E-R.com. Thank you, Franz Wigner. And again, those are the two sides of the business where you've got the, you know, in in essence, designers are both creative and Mm -hmm. consultant and psychologist Mm -hmm. and you know i don't say psychiatrist but i definitely think psychologist because you oh there's a lot (laughs) marriage counselors (laughs) Uh, yeah with so much of that going on and and i think you know that's the education side and i i want to stay on the education side for just one more quick second if you had three i don't say advice i don't say tips tricks hacks if Mm -hmm. you had three core principles Mm -hmm. that you think not just new designers, but that every designer should possess and Mm -hmm. should practice and employ, what would those three principles be? I think one of them is going to be boundaries. You have to have boundaries with yourself as with, as well as with your client, because a lot of designers and myself included are natural people pleasers. And so we want to make sure that we, that, you know, we, we do that. Um, So I think boundaries are key to set and to hold. Secondly, and this is, it seems very simple, but I believe it's not always the case is have a contract, (laughs) have a freaking contract that protects you as well as the client and have a lawyer in your state, look it over. Um, It's not one of those that you can just say, okay, well, that went wrong. So I'm going to put it in my contract. That went wrong. I'm going to put it in my contract. That's, that's a good foundation, but you need to have it. So it's enforceable. And third, So boundaries, a contract, and third would be, don't take yourself so seriously. Like we are not curing COVID. We're not curing cancer. Nobody's going to die in the operating room. So if you have your boundaries and you have your contract, you know, and then of course, you don't have a business structure, but there are so many times that we get so wrapped up in what we're doing because it feels so personal that it's not. So don't take things personal. So that last one was kind of convoluted, but I think it's important just to keep things in perspective. No, I, I think it's interesting. And now I'm, I want to flip the script on you and mm-hmm. take the same thing, those basic three concepts and apply them to the design. Mm-hmm. Right. And I think it's so important because lighten up, I think is brilliant and it makes perfect sense because when we start taking ourselves so seriously, mm-hmm. bad things are sure to follow. And yes. it's just, you know, lighten up. Um, yeah. The contract, I, I think, is absolutely brilliant. And, and I also think that it's so important right now because we are in an industry that does not have hard, fast, set rules. No. And it's so difficult to navigate if you're just coming in from, you know, from yesterday, if you're coming in and you're starting today, what parameters do you have? How much should I charge? What should we, you know what are the boundaries? What are the guidelines? What do I, de- what are my deliverables? It's not just a sofa. Who do you, who are your, 
Who are your clients? Who gravitates towards your design firm? That's a great question. We just recently, well, I guess it was last year, we went back through the exercise of um, creating our ideal client profile and we revisited who has become our client because it changes on a regular basis and we have to up-level our marketing and our approach and our, our, our messaging every few years. Our clients right now are busy individuals. Now they might be stay-at-home moms um, with, with a, a spouse who's working outside of the home, but they're all busy. So whether they are busy um, managing the schedules of their kids or they're managing the schedules of their own business or working outside of the home, they have children that they want to make a home for. They have, um, oftentimes they have a second home. And so they want their first home to also feel like a vacation. We have individuals who are very much in tune with understanding that you begin and end your day at home. And how you begin and end your day is going to allow you to be the best person, best mom, best husband, best wife, best professional, best friend that you can be because your environment shapes it. So we have our, our, our clients have become much more sophisticated as our business has grown. So I, I do want to share that with any designers, though, is like, don't look at people don't look at other designers and think that it happens overnight. It takes time. Like we're into year 14, 13, something like that um, of business. And I feel like we're just coming into our sweet spot with clients that have a very reasonable budget, a very understanding of um, not everything's going to be perfect right away, just and very sophisticated and considerate and fun. And it's just been a blessing, but it hasn't been easy. So interesting you say that because I find myself in very much the same scenario. And it's so easy. You know, I think I think social media mm-hmm. has has been a, a, a pox on our industry and a curse on our society. Um, and I don't say that lightly. Right. I, I think that you know, I don't think everything is 100% inherently bad or inherently good. I think that the, the manner in which we use it Mm -hmm. is detrimental to, to the growth and to what we do. Like, you know, any designer out there who will go to Instagram and will see some other designer out there and they'll see a post Mm -hmm. in the feed. And it's like, oh gosh, they're doing so great. And they've got all these clients and they've got, you have no idea what, what their situation is. It could be completely, and probably is completely manufactured. It's you know, you highlight reel. Yeah. And you look at social media and it's like, look what a, personally you look at, Oh gosh, what a wonderful life that person has. They're going to these places and they're doing those things, but you don't know what's really happening under the surface. And it, it takes, yeah. I feel like it takes some of the joy out of, out of life, looking at how wonderful everyone else's life is, but specifically as it relates to the business, you know, doing a, doing a podcast for nine years now and looking at when I started back in 2013 compared to where we are now, Mm -hmm. there's a bunch of people who have just sort of come into the space and some have, have gotten some popularity. doesn't make it good. It just means that they've hit on something or maybe they haven't, maybe they just market it better. Same with design, right? Yeah. And it doesn't even mean they're happy. Right. You know, just like, so I, I, I do agree that social media has been, it's been a blessing because we get a lot of clients from it, but it is also a curse, but you have to use it as a tool. And yeah. I think that if you use it as a tool strategically and not just as um, entertainment, then, then you can, you, you have, you can kind of pull yourself away from it. I was talking to one of my students yesterday who it's coincidentally was just miserable She's like, I'm exhausted. I hop on and blah, blah, blah. And I I told her, put put it down for a month. Step away. So it goes back to the first part of our conversation. Give yourself some white space. Take a break. Be still. Rest. You don't have to do it. I mean, she's got business. She's booked for the next six months. So if you take one month off, you know, you're not going to, and she works from referrals, you're not going to lose a bazillion dollars. So do that for yourself. It's so funny because I was, I was looking, um, I was looking back. The podcast is doing better than we've 
ever done before. And I was looking back and I don't think I've posted anything on Instagram in about six months. Amazing. And yeah. And it, it, that just sort of galvanized the point that mm-hmm. it's the interpersonal relationships. It's the, it's the connectivity and the connection to the business. Yes. And I think, you know, that's from your perspective, does the education and the design business, do they ever, are they ever in conflict? I think that there's, Yes, I do believe so, because what works for one person doesn't necessarily work for another, and everybody's mind works differently, and there's so much information out there that the education about business is still very unique to the individual, um, and you can't, you, can't look at what, and I, I, you can't look at what I teach and what I do in my flagship program and know that it's the end-all and be-all. It works great for a lot of people, but it's also, it's not a franchise take it and twist it and make it work for yourself. And I think that that's the same with any program, any educational platform, any coach, anything along that line, it's imperative to find somebody that works for something or some way that works for you and not assume that just because it's marketed well, it's, it's badass. It might be, it might not be, it might be badass for one person and not for another. One of the things that I absolutely love about doing this podcast Mm -hmm. is in the past, it was just the storytelling and the, and the connection with the guest. Then, you know, two years ago now, zoom became something that was a regular part of what I do. It really, you know, prior to March 13th of, of 2020, Mm -hmm. I, I, the number of interviews that I did on a, on a, on the phone, you could count on one hand. Now, the number of interviews I've done in person, you can count on one hand, (laughs) but what zoom has done is it's sort of opened up an opportunity. And I love this because it's kind of a curveball here, but one of the things that I found so fascinating and so wonderful is that I can see you and I can see the backdrop that you chose and, and the backdrop that you chose for, for our conversation is a real one. It's not a virtual one, which I think is fun too. And I feel like I can tell so much about you by what I'm seeing behind you, specifically, Mm -hmm. specifically as a designer. Mm -hmm. Symmetry. Yes. And and your selections with regard to accessorizing, I think, Mm -hmm. do say so much about people. What also says so much about you to me, and this is not like a Rorschach or (laughs) an analysis, but- you're not afraid of white spaces, right? You have, you have a brilliant sense of symmetry at the same time. It's not matchy matchy. Oh yeah. And I, and I'm curious what that, and the way that I compare that, you know, for what I do Mm -hmm. is, you know, when I, when I interview or when I have a conversation, when I talk to somebody, I, I, I don't feel like every moment has to have words in it. You can have a minute to breathe. Mm -hmm. And when I look at the design behind you, Mm -hmm. just sort of how it's established and what you chose to be a backdrop, what does that say? Does that define your work? And and I don't call it a style. Right. I I think it's more of a fingerprint. It's more of a, it's more of a guide in your style is, does that define how you work? I think that's, that's a really interesting conversational point. I would say, yes, I think that it goes back to finding some of that white space is that I don't, you you can't have every moment filled. You can't have every space on the wall filled. If you look over here, I have a completely black wall that's completely blank. So it's, but it's black. So um, I would say, yes, it does represent, and I'm kind of looking at my background, especially this thing here that says my brain has too many tabs open, (laughs) but it's functional. And I think that, um, I think that the function as well as aesthetic is a very key aspect for, for me personally. So you can see the baskets, they're all pretty full um, of stuff, but it's, it's still pleasing to the eye, but it's still very functional. And um, I fill things in only as they're necessary. I've really edited both my physical possessions, my clothing, my friends, my business, and I only keep what's important and, and what, what fulfills me. And it sounds selfish when I say that, but man, it has made me a much 
happier person to not get involved in all of the clutter of life, of business, of just stuff on the shelves. Do you translate that into your design philosophy with your clients? Um, I would say, yes, we are very practical with our clients. Uh, We'll spend where we need to spend. We'll pull back and save where we need to save. If something's very trendy um, and it might not last for very long, we definitely have that conversation with them. But I will say that our approach with clients is to really serve them, to dig into their head, find out what they want. We have clients that, you know, they, they'll pay 250 bucks for a pillow that they know they're only going to use for a couple of years. To me, that just seems a little, not what I would do, but we give them the option. So the pragmatic approach is where we start. And I think clients really dig that because we are very good stewards of their money. We are very good stewards of their space and we let them make a decision instead of us telling them exactly what they need to do. So it's fun. It's a lot of fun because it's almost like you take on different personalities for each project. So I don't know if that answered your question. It kind of said, we're all over the place with our clients, but we, we kind of are because we don't have a specific style. If you look at our projects, they don't, you don't look at them and say, oh, ML Interiors Group did that. It's very, they're all very unique. Yeah, no, it, it's funny because, and I've told this story a thousand times already, but when I first started doing the podcast, mm-hmm. I would ask this, look, I'm not a designer. I, I'm, I'm an enthusiast. I do not possess the talent to be an interior designer. Mm-hmm. So but I love it. So I get to talk to you and I get to talk to architects. And when I first started doing the show, I, I, I would ask creatives, what's your signature style. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because I have come to learn over time. At first I was like, I would ask the question and then I would get answers and, and, you know, nobody ever said, wow, that's really a stupid question. But after a while I started feeling like, wow, this is really a stupid question. I shouldn't be asking it. And then I kind of graduated into thought that it's not a stupid question. It's Mm-mm. a pedestrian one. It's just, it, it's, it's not, it, it's pedestrian. It's just very, very basic. Mm-hmm. And you're, you're never going to find anything that you can really latch onto at the end of the day, because it doesn't matter what your favorite style is. You're not designing for you. Right. But although I will say that there are some designers who have a look that, that if you, if as a client, enjoy that look, you would gravitate towards them versus towards somebody like us, you know, like Amber Lewis and McGee and company and Ginger Curtis of urbanology. Listen, I will, I will tell you something. I totally agree with you at the Mm -hmm. same time. And it's not, it's not a shot. Mm -hmm. It's not a criticism. It's not a critique, but I will tell you this personal opinion. If, if you, if one has a signature style, Mm-hmm. If one has a, a signature style and it's a go-to and every piece of work is along those lines that is a signature style, then there's no need for the designer any longer because artificial intelligence can simply recreate it based on a color palette and you know mm-hmm. materials. True. A- and I think that that also represents one of the greatest threats to the design industry. I mean, you know, you had Laurel and Wolf few years ago, you've got those, you've got the firms that are digital design groups. A a few years ago, I say a few, it's probably more like five or six. I was approached. The last two years, we don't really count. It doesn't count, right? It doesn't count. I was approached um, by a potential sponsor of the podcast. And it was a, it was a company that had created, that had created an algorithm that was marketing to the consumer side, basically to eliminate designers and architects from the process to say, if you like this, then you'll like that. If you like that, then you'll like this and basically put together a, a composition of what their style of design would look like. And then, you know, they worked with partners that they had to specify product. And it basically took the designer completely out of the equation. Interesting. And, and when I had the, I took the call and I had the meeting and I, and I said to them, I said, I, I think your idea is absolutely brilliant. I wish you great success mm-hmm. and I want nothing to do with it. 
And I turned the money down and I turned the sponsorship down because I believe in what creatives do. I believe that the skill and the talent that you have and how you work specifically with your clients is what comes to the true essence of what, you know, look, I'm a journalist and on the journalism side, AI, you've probably seen it in your Facebook feed. There are, um, there are companies that say, Hey, if you want the perfect editorial content, you know, here is a, here's a program. You, you order the software, or you subscribe right. to the service and you get, it'll create content for you. End of the day, it doesn't mean it's any good. It just means that it created something that may have a few things that represent you or your, or your style or your business. Well, and it takes the personal aspect away from it. Totally. We're in people's homes. And I think that you have to have that relationship and that trust because sometimes we're also going to push you outside of your boundaries. So, and, and by the way, with that, I, I think that when you talk about boundaries mm -hmm. and not to give you a complete run on sentence, but I'll, I'll elaborate on this for, for just a moment. I think that one of the most amazing things that designers do is they push the boundaries mm -hmm. for their clients with a reason, mm -hmm. with purpose, with a goal in mind. It's not just to say, well, if you like this, then you'll like that. If you like that, then you'll like this. And that'll be you a beautiful need space. You need, you, yeah. And we need more mm -hmm. right now from our design. Design, it, it, as, as it relates to how we live and work, has become so much more important I, and I mean that in the serious, truest sense of the word. I totally agree because we sell a feeling, not just things. Like, and that's one of the things that we talk about is like you sell joy and you sell happiness and you sell comfort and peace and harmony and you sell almost like a hug. How can you get that from AI? Totally true. So last question I have for you is, and I'm just curious. How has, I, I think it would be impossible to say to somebody, you know, ha, have the last two years changed you or your design at all, or your firm or your business or the way that you, you look or specify or the way that you design for your clients. It's impossible because everybody's changed mm -hmm. forever. How have your clients changed? Because I know that you adapt to your clients. What are clients asking you for now that maybe they weren't asking you for two years ago? How, how, has, the, how has the business, not the business of design, but how has what clients are asking for, how they want to be worked with, how has that changed? Well, I think that there's a softness to our interiors now that might not have been there before. And what I mean by that is that while texture has always been important, people are feeling a little bit more deeply their surroundings. So I think that they are a little bit more cognizant of the, the color palette, which is always important. I mean, that's the, the duh, but you know, just the different way that they are observing with their eyes, they're seeing their home through a lens of not just home, but also work and long-term and the amount of time that we spend in our homes now. So I think the softness, the, the, the level of cozy is a technical term. <laughs> the level of cozy has upped, you know, more, 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 more green plants, more throw blankets, more, um, you know, we, we I, literally test pillows and sofa upholstery on my cheek. Like, is this nap worthy? And I think we have more clients who, who understand that a little bit better now, but they also have the function blended in with their aesthetic, which we my team has always been really good at. So, but we're having more people ask for it instead of us telling them that's what we do. <laughs> We are living in a time of incredible growth, both technologically and creatively, with respect to interior design, exterior design, and architecture. There is no question. There are companies thinking differently 
about the business of design and how to make products super serve those for whom they're being made. One of those companies, and one of my favorites, is Moya Living, designer and fabricators of some of the most stunningly beautiful, incredibly durable, and highly functional kitchen, bath, and outdoor kitchen cabinetry on the market today. Powder-coated steel with stunning lines, vibrant colors to fit any design style or aesthetic. A history of designing cabinetry for the scientific community. So you know it's been tested in some of the truly the most harsh conditions available. Moya O'Neill is the CEO and founder of Moya Living. She's the inspiration behind the design. Designers, their specification process is so simple. It will make your job so much easier. Check them out online through the socials at Moya Living, their website, moyaliving.com, and in the real world, their live kitchen showroom in Fountain Valley, California. Thank you, Michelle. For more stories like this, make sure you are subscribing to the podcast. You can find the show everywhere you get your favorite podcasts. And of course, you knew that already. What you might not know is that there are seriously, literally hundreds of other Convo by Design episodes out there to binge on that you may not have heard. So go check them out. Just scroll down a little bit. You'll see them. Thank you, Thermosol, Article, York Wall Coverings, Franz Wigner, and Moya Living for your partnership and support. You are remarkable partners and amazing allies for the trade, and I appreciate you very much. And thank you for listening. Remember why you do what you do, and that the business of design is about making better the lives of those we serve. Until next week, be well, and take today first. (laughs) 